Welcome to Hot Chips 28. Session 9. High Performance Processors. Hello, my name is uh, David Lau, and I work in uh, Imagination Technologies uh, MIPS CPU uh, business unit. But more importantly, I'm the chair for the uh, high performance um, processor session. Um, I know it's a bit late, but we have three interesting presentations for you, so stay awake. That's, that's your job. <laughs> so let's get to it. Um, the two presentations, the two presenters for the first paper are Jack. Doek and Dr. Wenfu Kao from Intel. Jack Doek is a senior principal engineer at Intel. He serves at the, as the CPU chief technology architect responsible for the evolution and improvement of the i64 or x86 architecture. He received a BS in electrical engineering and an MS in computer engineering from the Technion Israel Institute of Technology in Haifa, Israel. Dr. Wenfu Kao is a graphics media architect in Intel's Visual and Parallel Computing Group, VPG. Uh, prior to joining VPG, he worked as a CPU architect with a focus of uh, performance analysis. He received a MS and PhD in computer science from University of California at Davis. Th this first presentation is about Intel's Skylake pro processor. Thanks, David, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. So before going to the topic, allow me to start with some archaeology. Uh, when I started preparing this uh, presentation, I remember that I was here exactly 10 years ago in, in Hot Chips to present uh, Merom, or Core to Do, as it was called. Uh, and I was really, really uh, curious to see what changed uh, in 10 years. So I'm going to reuse uh, this floor plan uh, slide from then and this table of uh, transistors and densities in order to show a historical pers perspective of what changed in 10 years, right? So on the uh, left side, you see a, a photo of the floor plan of uh, Skylake. This is a four core, but the comparison numbers are going to be a two core versus a two core Merom, which is in the right side. Why doesn't work the click? Here it is. So uh, in terms of performance, uh, Skylake is up to 10x more efficient than Meron because it's between three and five uh, times uh, the performance, but for half of the power. In terms of uh, densities, the process is uh, five times uh, denser than it was. Uh, the die size is one and a half times smaller, and the transistor count is uh, six times bigger. Um, up to 10x more efficient in 10 years, one and a half smaller six times the number of transistors. But that's not all. Skylake, the chips today, as we all know from the presentation we had, are much more complex. Uh, they expand through a larger number of segments, uh, have an array of different uh, capabilities. So for example, this, uh, for example, as uh, we saw in various SOC presentations, it has graphics, uh, memory, controller, image processing unit, etc., etc. whereas in 10 years ago, we were talking only about the core and the bus unit, maybe. So that's what changed in 10 years. Let's look at the results of Skylake. Uh, if we look at uh, Skylake in a 4.5 watt platform uh, compared to Broadwell uh, in a number of different benchmarks, you can see, for example, that in, sorry about that. For example, if spec FP rate, uh, Skylake is 25% faster than Broadwell it was. In Sysmark, for example, 11%. In terms of a, a Gaming performance is around 40% better than Haswell, uh, Broadwell, sorry. And in addition, uh, it can run 10 hours in battery life when playing a video 1080p. Similarly, if we look at a 15 watt platform, uh, those are the results. I'm going to change the clicker. Uh, spec FP rate is 28% faster. 
uh, gaming uh, 70% faster, up to 70%, as uh, shown by this benchmark uh, Manhattan, and the uh, battery life is nine, nine hours more. Let's go now into Skylake. I am going to briefly give a very fast overview of the SOC, uh, and then go into explanations of the cache and memory system. I hope that the power management section uh, will be of your interest. From that, we go into the core uh, changes. And my colleague, Wen Fu, is going to present the graphics and the media engine. So um, in the interest of time, uh, this is, uh, I am going, only going to talk about two points here. This, is, uh, this picture is public. You can find the data everywhere. The two points I want to highlight is that the higher skews of uh, processor graphics come together with an embedded in-package DRAM uh, to supply the required bandwidth. And the other interesting point is that uh, in addition to the traditional PC IOS that we always had, we added here, here tablet IOS. Uh, going into the memory uh, solutions, um, we optimize uh, for uh, less level cache uh, mishandling, uh, which allows to supply a lot of bandwidth, uh, in, for example, from the EDRAM. Uh, it can supply much more bandwidth, or alternatively, it can supply the same amount of bandwidth that used to, Broadwell used to supply, but uh, with a better uh, uh, power efficiency. In addition to that, uh, there is a new EDRAM architecture that I'm going to describe in the next slide. Uh, the, we support DDR4 up to 2.4 gigahertz, uh, and of course, uh, give, talking about the memory, the memory system includes the uh, memory encryption engine that has, is an integral part of the SGX technology that was introduced in Skylake. Finally, the array of various accelerators and uh, controllers um, require uh, delicate handling of the, of the memory bandwidth in order to supply the necessary quality of service to, uh, for example, isochronic traffic uh, generated, for example, by the display engine uh, and the ISP, the image signal processor. Um, this is a block diagram of the uh, cache hierarchy showing the. Uh, oh, sorry, I need to pick the other one. <laughs> showing the two cores with their uh, level one and level two caches and the graphic engine connected to the last level cache, uh, connecting through the memory controller via the system agent. Uh, in uh, Broadwell, the EDRAM, uh, the EDRAM is here by the way, was architected as a level four cache with the EDRAM tags placed statically allocated in the, in the last level cache, stealing half megabyte uh, per core uh, for that purpose. Uh, what we uh, did in Skylake is, uh, first of all, to move the EDRAM tags to its own array, uh, which, uh, which uh, frees half uh, megabyte uh, per core of last level cache for use of applications. But in addition to that, it also uh, disconnects the unwanted dependency between the capacity of the EDRAM and the number of cores. But what is even more interesting and important is that we moved, changed the architecture from being a level for a cache to being a memory side cache, which means that each and every memory access that goes into the memory controller is looked up in the EDRAM if a hit is uh, satisfied from there, and if it, if it misses, uh, it's allocated depending from the source. For example, I.O. we don't allocate. Uh, memory requests coming from I.O. devices, we don't allocate in the RAM. Uh, but what this creates is that uh, this uh, cache is totally invisible to software in terms of coherency, ordering, or any other aspect, and therefore is not uh, architectural with uh, one, uh, uh, in terms of visibility, this one uh, exception, the graphics driver may decide, if it chooses to, uh, to uh, determine that certain uh, memory access is allocated only on the EDRAM, only on the last level cache, or in the two of them. Uh, power management and optimizations. Um, I want to give a little uh, background before I show what we did in Skylake. Uh, ever since the modern power management was uh, created, it was the role of the OS to, uh, uh, to determine the operating point of the CPU in terms of uh, frequency and uh, voltage. Uh, a pair of that is what we call a P-state. So the OS determined the P-state. If the utilization of the CPU was high, uh, it asked the CPU to bump up the voltage and frequency, and uh, vice versa. Uh, the problem is that uh, the OS has, uh, there are fundamental limitations uh, when it comes uh, to do those optimizations by the OS. One of them is that the uh, granularity of time that the OS can use is in the range of tens of milliseconds, because more than that would be way too intrusive. 
Uh, and the other limitation is that the OS cannot uh, know, doesn't know really, uh, the instantaneous uh, beha microarchitectural behavior of the workload in the, inside the chip. Um, so here is uh, where, where it comes with within Skylake, which is called Intel Speed Shift Technology, uh, which is basically uh, fully hardware-managed speed states. Uh, in other words, the CPU determines at what voltage and frequency uh, to run. Uh, under the directives of the OS, but the OS will give a range uh, between minimum and maximum frequency. Typically, it will be the full range, but it's an option for the OS to do that. Uh, what we achieve by that is that the hardware uh, overcomes these two limitations that I mentioned. It has a better observability of uh, what is going on, uh, as well as operates at a faster uh, time. Uh, the result of this is higher performance and responsiveness, uh, in particular at power constraint form factors. Uh, uh, for example, in interactive work, we have observed uh, gains, instantaneous gains of up to 40% due to this technology. Um, in architectural interface uh, change. Obviously, this requires OS support and is implemented in Windows 10. Uh, the the uh, software interface uh, is com comprised of uh, enumeration of the frequencies and controlled by the OS. In the legacy, uh, the enumeration was the... Oops was uh, the uh, uh, P1, which is the guaranteed frequency, and the minimum frequency. Uh, the OS controlled the frequency of the P state here, and once uh, it was possible, it relinquished control to the hardware, which decided uh, what to do. In uh, Intel speed shift, we enumerate the whole range of frequency. Uh, the OS can decide maximum manual frequency, but uh, this is an option. It typically, will be the whole range. Um, Let's look inside. Uh, this chart represents uh, energy in the y-axis and the uh, frequency or performance in the x-axis. There are two distinct parts. On the right side is when the CPU uh, needs performance. Uh, either the OS, legacy OS or the autonomous algorithm will bump up the frequency when utilization is high and vice versa. And uh, in the left side is uh, when utilization is uh, low and there is no really need for performance, but uh, pay attention that if you go too low in frequency, uh, uh, we lose energy, basically. So there is an energy efficient point represented here by the, uh, this uh, red point. Uh, and one of the uh, innovations in uh, Skylake is that the hardware determines this point uh, instantaneously, uh, dynamically in real time, because it's a function of the operating conditions, the workload in the whole SOC, and other factors. Um, I talk about the hint that the OS can give. Uh, this hint can be seen as uh, the, amount of, uh, uh, the amount of energy that we are willing to spend in order to gain that performance. Uh, and that uh, hint can be satisfied as in, example, uh, as in this example by the uh, yellow dot uh, by some P frequency that attempts to satisfy that constraint. Uh, responsiveness, that's uh, another interesting point. Uh, the chart on the uh, left side uh, shows uh, uh, activity on the y-axis and time in seconds on the x-axis. Uh, and interactive use is characterized by uh, spurts of uh, uh, activity separated by uh, long periods of silence. If we zoom in into one of such, such boards, uh, bursts and look into the right side, uh, we see what's going on inside. So the green line denotes the CPU utilization that jumps instantaneously to 200%. Uh, after a, a low-pass filter, the CPU will uh, see that and bump the frequency all the way to the maximum uh, to achieve responsiveness. And if we look at the original or the legacy algorithm, it's depicted by this red line, uh, and it shows that it will take much longer. This is what gives much better responsiveness to the user. Uh, also, in the Skylake core, we did a lot of optimizations. We look at the high power, high performance scenarios, at the low power or low utilization scenarios, at a no utilization at all, and we improved all of those. For example, we power gate the AVX2 hardware because when it is not in use, it will have uh, caused uh, energy waste by, of leakage, right? And similarly, we don't scale other resources in the chip. Also, battery life was very important, uh, and we did uh, many, many changes to improve that. And the net result is uh, better performance per watt in the core as well, uh, including focus at power low utilization for battery life. Um, let's talk a little bit about the core. Um, 
So, uh, unfortunately, the scope of the presentation will not allow me to explain all this, but it's pretty much based uh, at high level in the same Broadwell microarchitecture with uh, several changes. Here we extend the Broadwell microarchitecture supply additional IPC, uh, higher frequency, and extend the dynamic range in terms of power. Uh, the core is high, uh, wider and, and uh, deeper, but in a power efficient uh, way, because we wanted to bring the PC levels of performance to tablet form factors. Um, so let's go into the front end. Uh, this is the front end of the machine. We increase the bandwidth of uh, uh, delivery of EOPS to the back end. The EOP cache delivers six EOPS per clock instead of four before, and the decoders deliver five EOPS per clock. Uh, there is a higher capacity branch predictor that also has uh, improved uh, mispredicting uh, latency for, for the case of uh, uh, wrong target prediction. Uh, also, the uh, instruction prefetch is faster. It looks deeper into the stream of uh, bytes. In addition to that, the EOPQ, which is more or less the interface between the uh, in-order part of the machine and the out-of-order of the machine, uh, was increased uh, from uh, 28 uh, EOPs uh, in Broadwell to 64 here. In the Skylake core, we increase the uh, out-of-order uh, buffer uh, resources because we know that this is one of the ways to extract a more instruction level parallelism because the CPU can observe a bigger uh, window of instructions. Uh, the RS reservation station or scheduler was increased by uh, around 50% to 97 entries, and the reorder buffer from 192 in Broadwell to 224 entries here. In the execution units, there are a number of uh, improvements. Uh, the divide and square uh, root latency and throughput were improved. The latency and, uh, and the throughput of uh, F, uh, FMA and Moore was unif made uniform, uh, four cycles, uh, two, two per clock. And finally, the latency of the AES instruction was improved from seven uh, clocks to four clocks. Uh, in the memory system, uh, we also, by the way, sorry about that, there is a mistake in the slide, only the store buffer is bigger. Uh, I couldn't fix that. Uh, in addition, there are uh, latency improvements in a number of scenarios that are more, uh, more uh, frequent than uh, people used to think. There is a reduced penalty for uh, page split loads. Uh, it was made equal to line split loads. Uh, the average uh, latency for, uh, to forward the uh, uh, load from a store was improved. And the stores that miss the level one cache generate a request to the next level cache much earlier than before. In terms of bandwidth, uh, the bandwidth uh, from L2 to L3 was improved, uh, and the right bandwidth from L3 was, uh, to L3, sorry, was also improved from four, four cycles per line to two cycles per line. Uh, putting this all together, uh, looking again to summarize, this is the same block diagram as three slides ago. Uh, we basically uh, improved the uh, size of the out-of-order uh, resources uh, and balanced that by improving the branch predictor. In addition, there are a number of uh, optimizations in the execution and memory clusters for a number of different scenarios. And here is where my colleague picks up. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Oh. So, uh, so I get to spend a few minutes to talk about uh, graphics media uh, features inside the Skylake. So um, with limited time, I'm not going to go uh, over those slides I cre originally created. I think people can read the slides uh, afterward. And also, you, are, you should be able to find a lot of information about the Skylake graphics and media features that we have uh, disclosed previously. So today, I'm going to just pick two main things that we think may be more interesting that we may not have uh, always addressed uh, in the past for people. So two things uh, I'd like to address is the graphic scalability and the uh, flexible power management inside this. So this is a typical uh, diagram of the Skylake graphics. Typical is called a GT2. So this is the smaller graphics that you typically go. So I quickly highlight this thing. This is our typical code slice, which is your primary compute and graphics render resources. A lot of resources uh, along the side, we call it on slice, and that is part of your 3D fixed function unit and your media, uh, media fixed function engine. And be, be aware that we also put some of the media functions inside the slice. Okay. So what about scalability? For this kind of design, we should be able to easily stack up more slices when you want to build a bigger machine. Right? You can put two sizes to form GT3 SKU. You can put two, uh, three sizes for the biggest one, the Iris Pro GT4. 
along the side, when you put two sizes there, you can also choose to put more media engines uh, to double those engines because you want to keep up the uh, performance and throughput. When we go for the biggest graphics GT4 SKU which, with three sizes, you don't need to uh, double again because we believe you have enough uh, throughput. So what does that mean to us? So that means for the biggest uh, graphics that we build, it can go to as big as Skylake uh, Xeon E3 uh, processor, which has the Iris Pro inside. How small it should go? With this one, it can go even further. I can cut more uh, execution unit, further string the throughput to make it an, a lot smaller, which was the announced uh, Intel Joe last week in IDF, a very small uh, processor that actually has the same uh, graphics architecture inside this small chip. So that is how small it is. Then I'm talking, going to talk about the flexible power management. As Jack highlighted, the, the Skylake project is all about power efficiency. So graphics uh, it should be the same, right? Things that we want to do to be more aggressive, to really optimize anywhere from 4.5 watt to uh, up to actually 45 watt in mobile and even higher for uh, a desktop skill. So look at this diagram. First thing you want to see is, what about how many slices? If I don't need many slices, can I have an option to turn on, on and off? The answer is yes. With, when you need uh, more slices, you can turn them all on. When you don't need to use them many slices, you can turn them off. And another key changes from previous generation is, when you don't need anything, all three slices can turn off and only keeping on slice on. So that's one thing. So that means that when you only need to do a video playback and to some uh, display engine, nothing else needs to be turned on. You can only maintain just fixed function. And of course, within a slice, you also have another granularity. For example, uh, do you have to always use the three sub sizes? I guess not all the time. So when you don't need to use any of the subsizes, they can be uh, clock gated. So it can maintain a very lower power without uh, wasting your energy. Furthermore, within, a sub, uh, within this subsize, what about execution unit? Each subsize has uh, eight execution units. So total, uh, you have 24 execution units within a size. Do you always need to use all the execution unit? Again, the answer is no. So you also have the option to turn on and off uh, as a pair of the execution units. So you can turn on maybe uh, half of the EU per subsize when you are doing some of the uh, lighter, lighter tasks of the media encoding. But say when you really need to have a, a high quality, very powerful uh, video transcode or the uh, OpenCL compute, then turn on all the EUs with all the uh, assets. Then that's the flexibility. Now comes to the next questions. If I giving everyone the flexible power management, then there's the, the another thing we want to provide is the flexible frequency management. In the past, the turbo frequency is only one. The maximum turbo frequency for graphics is one. So if you can operate machine in a different configuration, you shouldn't be limited by that. So starting from this architecture, what we do is now you have uh, multiple VF curve, the voltage frequency curve. So when you are operating with only on size, you will, ha you will have one curve which gives you the, probably uh, the highest frequency at the same voltage. If you are operating with uh, on size with one size or on size with two sizes, then you have multiple curves. So for each machine configuration for the graphics, you will be getting an, uh, one uh, unique maximum turbo frequency. So this flex flexibility is to give you uh, to trade off between parallelism and the frequency. So when you are at smaller configuration, then we can get some more performance because you can operate at a smaller configuration, less leakage. When you really need to turn on all the sizes with a demanding computation, then you can be wider, but your frequency will have to be a little bit lower. So that, that is what we do. Yep. So I'm going to give uh, back to uh, Jack on the conclusion, and I believe uh, you are able to see some of the features here uh, when we uh, share the slides with everyone. You're not talking about those? <laughs> we have two minutes for you. Okay. So
So putting it all together and making a summary, Skylake delivers uh, record levels of performance um, and battery life in many personal use cases in, uh, in the various form factors. The interspeed shift technology uh, provides uh, responsiveness and performance uh, also in constraint form factors. The Skylake processor graphic uh, delivers scalable performance, more than one teraflop uh, compute, enhanced slow power media engines, and flexible power management, and end-to-end -end 4K experience. And things I didn't have the time to talk uh, during the presentation, but I say here in the summary, is that the Skylake family of products gives a lot of choice to platform developers in terms of uh, uh, richness of devices and IOS, as well as in TDPs. And the advanced uh, perform uh, performance monitoring unit that we have in Skylake that also I didn't describe, uh, allows software developers to squeeze uh, every drop of performance that is possible. Um, I also remind that Skylake introduced here uh, the uh, software guard extension technology, which is uh, considered a, a lane change in terms of uh, security of trusted applications in the mainstream software environment. Uh, thank you. That's all I have. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, uh, a reminder, please give your name and affiliation affiliation before asking your question. And I think someone's over there. You can ask them. Please go ahead. Trevi Kram from Google. Um, I have a question on uh, hyperthreading performance. Uh, can you comment on what you might have done for hyperthreading in Skylake and uh, uh, what we can expect out of it? Well, yeah, the... the, the um All the things we did also affect uh, 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 hyperthreading performance, and the benchmark numbers that I showed was uh, the 25% was spec FP rate, uh, which includes uh, hyperthreading performance. So I'm not saying exactly what we did, but also that improved. Thanks. I am Sivam from Qualcomm Research. Uh, you explained about autonomous power control. Uh, do you have per core autonomous power control? Sorry, the, I, I'm not sure I follow the question. So you explained about autonomous P state control in hardware. Yeah. Do you have that autonomous P state control per core? Like every core has its autonomous P state control? In general, the autonomous control is, uh, is centralized, but uh, each core is managed separately. Uh, the operating point of each core is separate. Okay. But the management is centralized. That, uh, did that answer the question? Yeah, kind of. OK, thanks. Uh, hi, uh, Motoy from Global Foundries. Uh, thank you for the fine uh, presentation. Uh, my question is related to the uh, P state and the power efficiency. I think the uh, Intel has to uh, the uh, used to uh, push the uh, integrated voltage regulator uh, called FV, uh, FIVR, I think. Right. And uh, can you make any state or comment on the uh, migrate again on in the future processor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, really, you know, tell you the truth, I don't have a lot of knowledge on that topic, uh, so I, I don't have the answer for you. <laughs> Apologize. Good question and, and good <laughs> answer. Thank you. Go ahead. Addison Snell, Intersect 360 Research. Your presentation focused a little bit more on the Intel core incarnations of Skylake. How would your presentation have been different if you'd been thinking more about the Xeon incarnations and say HPC or hyperscale? Yeah, that's a good question. So everything that I said uh, in particular, or sorry, everything that I said about the core uh, will be used as a basis for the next uh, server product. But at this point in time, we're not disclosing uh, future, uh, future products. But uh, it, will, it will come at the time, uh, the appropriate time. And we have done things uh, for those, uh, for HPC and other things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a few questions myself. Um, for the EDRAM, um, what um, kind of data, what kind of data structures are most uh, benefits from the EDRAM uh, placement? Maybe I can answer this one. Actually, one of the main advantages of having EDRAM is your uh, uh, media and video processing. For 64 megabytes, you actually can put uh, the entire 1080p workload there. And for 120 megabytes uh, EDRAM, you actually can easily process 2K and 4K. So if I give you a data, uh, data point, with uh, highly optimized driver uh, for the media, you can minimize video transcode 1080p to 1080p uh, DRAM bandwidth to be less than 2 gigabytes per second. That's uh, for EDRAM advantage. And the performance uh, boost can be more than 10%. 
Okay, I have a few more since no, no one else is standing up. Um, for the hardware power management uh, P states, can the min, max, and preference settings be dynamically changed, uh, especially for OSs which are, uh, could be context switched in and out uh, when run virtualized? Yes, the interface is basically uh, something like uh, MSRs that the OS can write and uh, determine the minimum and maximum frequency. It's not something that takes a lot of time, right? Okay. Very fast. Okay. And then uh, one last question. Um, are there any um, quality of service or th throughput priority controls um, for the GPU or the video engine in the ring interconnect? Yeah. I actually was the uh, Encore architect back in Ivy Bridge. So within the Encore interface uh, with the cache and all this uh, uh, in, in, in internal queue, we actually did a lot of effort to balance between CPU and GPU traffic. So there, is there are multiple mechanisms to manage between the CPU traffic and GPU traffic. OK, I don't see any more questions. Let's give it up for the uh, Intel presenters. Thank you. Okay, um, the next presenter is Brian Tomko from IBM. Brian is a senior technical staff member for IBM's Power Systems processor team in Austin, Texas. He is one of the lead architects for Power 9 and future power processors. He has been with IBM for 17 years. This presentation is about IBM's Power 9 processor. I'm very excited to be here today to talk about all the technology and capabilities that we've packed into our Power9 processor. Let me start by giving you a little bit of a look back. Power has been a very strong player in the server market with technological innovations that we've driven since Power4 leading to market leadership in the Unix market. With Power8, we really broadened out and opened up the Open Power Foundation with our partners, looking to exploit the Power8 technology across a broader range of platforms. Additionally, in Power8, we took all the capability that we had developed for high bandwidth, high data management for SMPs, and we applied it to problems of big data optimization. With Power9, we're taking the next step in involving the ecosystem of the Power Roadmap. Power9 truly is built for the cognitive era. We have a brand new core and chip architecture that delivers enhanced performance across a very broad range of workloads with deep optimizations, including emerging cognitive applications. Additionally, we have, for the first time, a true family of silicon as the Power9 family, including silicon that's been optimized for scale out and scale up, from the hyperscale data center all the way to our bulletproof enterprise class servers. And we're introducing a very broad array of technologies to enable the next generation of heterogeneous compute that's necessary to scale performance across a broad range of applications in the post-Moore's Law era. So taking a deeper look at how we evolved improved performance and capability across a broad range of workloads, for cognitive and AI, our stronger threat performance couples nicely with the enhanced capability provided by our accelerators and GPU Connect, allowing for unparalleled heterogeneous compute Additionally, for the HPC market, we have direct attached memory with high bandwidth coupled with seamless GPU-CPU integration. And for the cloud and virtualization space, we have a host of new architected virtualization features that couple nicely with new state-of-the-art I.O. attached technology and a new commodity form factor enabled by our, our scale-out differentiated silicon that really play nicely in the cloud and virtualization space. Additionally, we continue to target our enterprise class servers, of course, you know, delivering unparalleled scalability and capacity and bulletproof RAS and server performance into the enterprise class space. So that gives you an idea of the type of workloads that we really targeted with Power9. Now let's take a little bit of a deeper look into the microarchitecture and the capabilities. Our Power9 processor, you can see the die photo there, delivers brand new cores brand new core architecture, implementing a brand new Power ISA 3.0. Additionally, to feed, those power, to feed those cores, we have a massive cache, EDRAM 120 megabytes in 12 seg, uh, L3 regions in a NUCA architecture. That EDRAM, 
technology is enabled on Global Foundry's 14 HP technology, which also includes 17 metal layers, allowing us to include very robust on-chip switching to connect all of those cores, caches, the memory, and accelerated attaches, attachments. For the cloud space and for virtualization, I mentioned we have brand new architectural features. Those include features in security, as well as new features to optimize highly virtualized uh, app, uh, servers, reducing the overhead of virtualization significantly. Additionally, we are introducing, as I mentioned, a very broad range of, cap of capabilities for attaching accelerators. That begins with our I.O. We're bringing leadership I.O. with Power9, including PCI Gen 4, 48 lanes, and we've got a new technology that I'm calling for this presentation 25G Link. This technology enables us to connect 25 gigabits per second per lane for between 48 and 96 lanes of capability to connect our processors with other processors on our SMP Connect for our scale-up systems. And it's also available for both scale-out and scale-up processors to connect accelerators to our CPU for best ever connectivity for bandwidth and including additional features. Some of those key features include building on our technology from Power8, where we introduced the coherently attached processor interface. We're enabling coherently attached processor interface 2.0. That runs on top of PCIe Gen 4. And running on top of the 25G link, we have a brand new version of CAPI that opens up CAPI further, reduces latency further, and provides the outstanding uh, bandwidth provided by that 25G link interface. Additionally, you heard David Foley yesterday talk about NVLink 1.0 capability that IBM and NVIDIA developed and are, take, and are being exploited with po new Power 8 systems that are being made available that can run with really high bandwidths between a GPU and CPU. Power 9 will take the next step in evolving that interface with NVLink 2.0, bringing even more bandwidth and even a broader range of features to integrate the CPU and GPU together. So let's take a look at the four first members of the Power9 family. We have two variations of our, pro of our processor that are optimized for the scale-out space. These provide eight channels of DDR4 memory, up to 120 gigabytes of sustained memory there, and providing commodity package form factoring, which is key to scale across the broad range of, of IT deployment uh, space. And we're offering our scale-up processor, which includes the robust buffered memory solution, and industry-leading RAS and SMP scalability. Additionally, we're providing variations of both processors that are optimized for different ecosystems. For the PowerVM, which includes the uh, AIX and IBM i uh, customer base solutions, we are offering an SMT8 core, 12 of those per socket. And optimized for the Linux space, we're offering a 24-core SMT4 core that fits very nicely in, that, in the highly virtualized space for cloud. So talking a little bit more and going introduce you to our new processor core. First of all, let me show you the processor resources. Shown here is the SMT8 processor resources, which you can see are double that of the SMT4 core. And as I mentioned, the SMT8 core is designed for very large partitions, the kind that you find in our enterprise class server workloads and provide good, uh, perfect continuity with Power 8 SMT8 workloads that our customers really appreciate. Additionally, our SMT4 core was micro-architected along with SMT8 based on a modular micro-architecture, which I'll talk about in a moment. That enabled us to build both cores off the same micro-architectural building blocks. These new cores are also optimized to deliver differentiated features for both scale-out and scale-up, with features in place for prefetch, memory bandwidth management, and sectoring of lines from 128 down to 64 byte sectors to manage low bandwidth uh, system configurations. So looking a little bit deeper, how did we do this modular core? We call it ex an execution slice microarchitecture. If you take a look at the die floor plan here, you can really see the dramatic change in microarchitecture moving from power eight to power nine. So an execution slice, what is it? Well, we started with a 64 bit compute building block. And we coupled that with a 64-bit LSU load store building block. Each compute building block has a heterogeneous mix of compute, fixed and float, supporting scalar and vector. This allows us to, to obtain high utilization of our compute resources 
while also providing seamless exchange of data through shared data paths. And it serves as an efficient building block for managing instruction flow through the machine. We couple two of these 64-bit slices together to make a 128-bit super slice. This is our physical design building block. And two of those 128-bit super slices form a single SMT4 core, while we put four together to form an SMT8 core. So this execution slice technology, the new, uh, it actually enables a very efficient pipeline. We were able to cut five cycles fetched to compute from our pipeline, moving from power eight to power nine. Additionally, we cut out a similar number of cycles for a fixed point from fetch to retire, and actually eight cycles from fetch to retire for floating point instructions. That significant savings in pipeline depth provides for a leaner, stronger core with stronger thread performance. And we have advanced branch prediction capabilities where we've grown the strength of our branch predictors to remove wasted work from the machine. Our pipeline also supports enhanced capability with respect to how we manage instructions. With increased fusion and a reduction of the amount of instructions that we crack, also removing former microarchitecture of grouping instructions at dispatch. And in the load store pipeline and throughout, we get increased uh, efficiency in handling hazards. And that's really enabled strongly by this execution slice technology. We also increased our lock performance for both contested and uncontested locks. And we added new features to proactively avoid hazards. Here I have depicted the resources in the SMT4 core. I actually started out with a picture of the SMT8 core resources, but they weren't very readable on the slide, so I apologize. Uh, but SMT4 core resources shown here, and the SMT8 core has twice the number of resources. Some of the highlights here include a full 128-bit uh, quad precision fixed point unit times two in the SMT4 core, and a full quad precision 128-bit floating point unit in addition to our cryptography unit uh, per SMT4 core. We also offer in the SMT4 core 32-kilobyte instruction cache, 8-way, and 32-kilobyte decache. And we're offering four uh, load store executions concurrently and a robust set of four address generation and computation units that are independent from the data execution. So let me tell you a little bit more about the instruction set architecture implemented on Power9. Power9 is the first architecture to implement ISA 3.0 power, which has been available, made available, uh, published through our Open Power uh, Foundation. This architecture inc includes a broad range of, of uh, improvements for SIMD instruction types and instruction data type management, including, as I mentioned, true 128-bit floating point uh, quad precision execution, and enhanced BCD and decimal integer for COBOL and database applications. Additionally, we are supporting a random number generator through a single instruction, which, is NI, which will be designed to be NIST certified. We also have very high scale memory atomics executed at the memory controller and issued by instruction from the CPU. This allows for high scale data centric applications to run very well on Power9. We're also bringing in a number of other optimizations uh, in Power9. We have a hardware-assisted garbage collection, enabling the reduction of the stop the world pauses uh, with a new garbage collection algorithm uh, for interpreted languages that can be enabled through Power9. And we've got a number of virtualization optimizations. One of the highlights there is our new interrupt handling architecture, which actually routes interrupts to the partitions in the machine where they need to go avoiding uh, any unnecessary wake-ups and hiccups, and also providing uh, increased virtualization scaling and a reduction in virtualization overhead. Additionally, we've got enhanced access to our accelerators, including the on-die accelerators uh, from a user mode state with full virtual, virtual addressing and without the need for any supervisor or hypervisor code calls. We also have new security features in the form of hardware-enforced trusted execution to provide strong isolation in the data center. Finally, from an architectural perspective, I'll highlight that we have added new features for managing energy. We have a new set of instructions that are coupled with our new microarchitecture for quicker, more responsive 
uh, sleep and wake-up times, allowing, us to, allowing software to employ sleep more frequently, saving energy, and allowing us to deploy that energy with our new workload optimized frequency algorithm that moves energy between threads and cores to boost frequency even more dynamically than before. So feeding our powerful cores, we have really, as I mentioned, some very, very uh, essential elements to a scalable uh, computer. We've got very strong cache enabled by the EDRAM. As I mentioned, 120 megabytes per chip. That's implemented as uh, 20 ways per each of the 12 L3 regional slices, or L3 regions. That also includes enhanced capabilities for uh, logical replacement, enabling even more effective use of those caches. And to feed these caches and these cores, as I mentioned, we have the 17 layer, layer of metal enabled high-speed switching, which enables connectivity seamlessly between accelerators, memory, caches, and the cores concurrently. I mentioned we have the scale out and scale up. Let me tell you a little bit more about the memory subsystems for each of these. For the scale out system, we have eight ports of DDR4 memory designed to operate up to 2667. These are capable of supporting up to four terabytes per socket if you buy large enough DIMMs. And we've got for the scale up space, uh, continue to offer our agnostic memory interface powered by our memory buffered solution which enables really the highest capacity and scale with up to eight terabytes per socket and 230 gigabytes per second sustained memory bandwidth. If I didn't mention, you get up to 120 gigabytes per second sustained bandwidth over our direct attached solution. Still a very strong offering in the scale out space. So you put all this together and you get very strong core performance. We're seeing performance ranging across int, float, commercial, and a number of analytic and other representative cognitive workloads that scale from over 1.5 to well over 2x in performance from a microarchitecture perspective at constant frequency. So I mentioned to you earlier, and let me go a little bit deeper to explain to you why Power9 really is the premier platform for accelerated computing. First of all, it starts with our interconnects. We have the latest generation of PCIe, PCIe Gen 4, and as I mentioned, 48 lanes of that on any of the socket configurations. And additionally, we've got this new interface that I call 25G Connect. 48 lanes of the 25G Connect are available for accelerated computing, delivering up to 300 gigabytes per second in bi-directional bandwidth. That is tremendous bandwidth available for accelerated computing. On top of that, we have advanced protocols that seamlessly integrate accelerators and CPU. As I mentioned, we have offered CAPI protocol on Power 8, and on Power 9, we're doing CAPI 2.0 over PCIe. It actually quadruples the amount of bandwidth that we can, that we can run over CAPI. For the new CAPI protocol, it's going to run on top of that 300 gigabyte per second uh, uh, signaling interface, and it's going to provide even stronger connection between the accelerator and the CPU by removing key bottlenecks that can exist in the system and shortening latency in addition to the bandwidth growth, making even tighter coupling and an even more open coupling between CPU and GPU, excuse me, between CPU and accelerator. And as I mentioned, we have the next generation of NVLink, which is NVLink 2.0, providing even greater bandwidth and connectivity. To illustrate this, I show here, compared to PCIe Gen 3, what we accomplished you know, working with NVIDIA for NVLink 1.0. We get 5x the bandwidth, as you saw yesterday. Now, looking forward to Power 9, opening it up to a broad range of accelerators, we're looking at 7 to 10x the bandwidth compared to PCIe Gen 3. That is a significant bandwidth boost that when you couple it together, with the coherent management on die for Power9 with accelerators. And we also have enhanced virtualization and address translation capabilities on die as well. Really providing for a very seamless integration between CPU and, gem and, and uh, accelerators, including very strong memory sharing capabilities. 
When you put all that together, it really changes the entire dynamic for accelerated computing and opens up the possibility of the next level of acceleration across even broader range of workloads than we've ever seen before. And as you've heard at this conference, there's a lot of investment going into this space. And we believe that optimization in this space is really the, the wave of the future. So I mentioned earlier that we uh, formed the Open Power uh, Foundation around the time of Power 8. You know, when we started, there were five charter members, and IBM was one of them. We are now up to over 250 members in the Open Power Foundation, working together and collaborating on technologies and solutions built around power. Also, working together to push the frontier of open standards computing and open standards uh, servers. Some of the examples of that, and maybe one of the best examples of that, as you heard yesterday from David Foley, is the work that NVIDIA and IBM have done together on the NVLink, and really coupling CPUs and GPUs like never before. So you put it all together, we've got an enhanced core and chip architecture delivering strong performance improvements across a very broad range of workloads. We've also got a true processor family for the first time with power, silicon optimized for both scale out and scale up solutions, for commodity form factor packaging, all the way up to our bulletproof enterprise class servers, and a premier acceleration platform in Power9. And we truly do have a chip that will be the processor for the cognitive era. Thank you. Okay, we have time for uh, questions. Um, uh, please go ahead. Again, uh, name and affiliation first. Thera Scarlet, Frost Flower Technologies. A uh, couple here. First is, what's the L1 configuration on the SMT8 core? SMT8 core provides 64K uh, per core times 12 cores available to the threads. Okay, so 32 plus 32 split still? Yeah, single thread, uh, when we're, if you're asking, for threads, since Power 7, we've had a, a management scheme where we partition resources to provide strong thread isolation. We continue that policy on Power 9. Uh, when you're running SMT 8, uh, four threads would get access to 32K, and other four threads would get access to another 32K. Okay, and the other question I had there was, uh, you mentioned the hardware enforced trusted execution. How does that work, and can the user manage the root of trust for that in terms of flashing keys? Yeah, we do have uh, root of trust capability. I'm, I'm not going to be able to go uh, much deeper on the hardware enforced trusted execution details at this time. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Please go ahead on this side. David Cantor, um, what are the primitives that you have for accelerating garbage collection? And then also, what's the uh, shutdown and wake up time for your cores, since those got faster? Yeah. Um, for garbage collection, we have new primitives that do um, address range monitoring coupled with uh, what we call event-based branches that allow the garbage monitoring code to be notified, um, and this works concurrently with the, with the cooperative software algorithm uh, for doing concurrent uh, management of, you know, movement of region-based uh, garbage collection. Cool. And, and, and for the, um, right, your second question on the, um, Wake up the wake-up time, um, you know, ballpark around uh, 200 microseconds. Excellent, thanks. Yeah. Please go ahead. Uh, this side. Bill Rash, uh, Intel. I had a question to clarify the performance slide. Sure. Uh, the slide says socket performance, and it also says core performance. So I'm wondering, is that one core being measured, or is that all cores active? Yeah, that, that's all cores active. And uh, we, want, we put core performance uh, just because many of those applications are acceleratable uh, with accelerators, and this was just showing that this is performance just gained from improvements in the core microarchitecture. Mm -hmm. And the uh, Power 8 that's used for the reference, uh, is that the Power 8 with the memory buffers, all eight of them, or, or uh, the open power version? Yeah, this is with the memory buffers, but um, you know, as a baseline, we, we actually looked at the version that's more centered for open power, which is at about half of those. That's with four yeah. memory buffers. Right. Four. Okay, thank you. Please go ahead. Nathan Brookwood, Insight 64. I'm a little confused on the physical links that you're using for the NVLink 2 and Blue Link. Or is that the same stuff, or are they different physical links? Uh, the 
the same physical interconnect will be used, that, 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 that interface with 48 lanes dedicated for acceleration. We have another 48 on our scale up that's for the SMP. Uh, that interface is capable of going up to 25 gigabits per second. And um, the NV link will use those same FIs uh, as, as the new version of CAPI will that run on top of those. So it's the same signaling, just different protocols on top. Uh, the same signaling capability. And we're not disclosing the details of NV link 2.0 at this time. But the, same, um, the hardware has the same signaling link capability. And NV link 2 will run on top of those same physical connections. Okay. A second question, since you're coming out in the second half of 17, during that time, there are likely to be a handful of suppliers who are providing NV DIMMs with some sort of persistent memory that plugs into a DDR4 slot. Are you making any provision to accommodate that kind of memory in order to get higher capacity persistent memory with low latency? Yeah, good question. Uh, one of the things that we've architected that um, new CAPI interface for is exactly to address uh, persistent memory solutions. Uh, we don't have anything to disclose at this time, but we've architected it in such a way to, to address that type of need. So it would come in as a device rather than as a memory module? No, you could come in as a memory module directly. OK, thank you. Uh, this, this side. I'm uh, Jose Renau, UC Santa Cruz. Uh, for uh, something like a specking, single thread, 2006 performance, what's the difference between the SMT4 core and the SMT8? Yeah, Is because we're version? tending to utilize all the threads on the but processor. You, you use one. You, yes. Oh, well, we, for rate, we tend to use all the, all the threads on the processor, then you're going to get the same spec score out of both SMT4 and SMT8. Yeah, when you look at specific applications. But uh, the single thread, not the rate? You... Ah, single thread. Yes. Um, running single thread, we do partition the resources of the core uh, for single thread, and we actually allow, we actually can power gate other portions of the core uh, to boost single thread performance. We actually found that that was actually the optimal point for single thread. So you actually will get approximately the same uh, performance for single thread if you're just running one thread per chip. Yeah. Same performance with the 74 and 78. If you ran a single thread per chip. Yes. Yes. Please go ahead. So Bill Kramer, University of Illinois. Uh, <clears throat> this is a question I know has many facets above the chip, but uh, the chip is an important starting point. Uh, IBM has done very well with raw performance and, and measured performance, but price performance has been challenging the last couple of generations, at least in the science computing areas. What have you done in the design of, in uh, planning for the chip that would help address the price performance issues? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, it's a great question. I mean, the, the differentiated silicon and really having now a piece, uh, two uh, forms of variations of our chip that, you know, can support direct attached memory. You know, it lowers the overall power envelope of the system um, and, it low, and it lowers the cost, allowing really for commodity packaging. And, you know, our open power partners, um, we, we will have systems available. There have been some announcements already uh, some of our partners that have already developed systems for Power9. So we believe that that, that step of, of allowing for direct attached memory really will go a long way, uh, uh, really will provide for very, very effective system cost optimization points. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dilip Bandarkar, Qualcomm. To follow up on Bill Rash's question, uh, that, that performance chart, uh, with the Power8 and Power9 at the same core count, or did the Power9 have twice as many cores? Uh, that's what. That's with all threads, all cores active. No, but how a many cores on Power 8 and how many cores on Power 9 for that chart? 12 SMT8, 12 SMT8. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, um, I have a few questions since there's no, no more uh, questions out in the audience. Uh, since you're building a, a wide SMT uh, design plus SMP, uh, where is the intelligence that's deciding the placement of the software threads on the physical cores, um, uh, basically from the point of power management? Is it purely within the OS kernel, or are there hints from the hardware, or any kind of hardware assist for that? Yeah, there, there is hardware assistance in managing the threads back to the hypervisors. Uh, but ultimately, it's, it's uh, policies that are set at the hypervisor and OS level that really place the threads on cores. OK, another question that, that I have is, um, can you give some specifics on the on-chip interconnect? Is it a knock? Is it a ring? Is it, is it a single clock domain? It's really a, cust it's really a customized um, uh, switch connect. I mean, it, 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 
we really uh, provide very broad bandwidth, connect, you know, available to the cores and the caches with, with different ramps for each, and, and separate interconnects also for the memory and the accelerators. So it's a, it's a highly customized uh, on-chip interconnect. Okay. And then one last question then. Um, are there any, you described the slice methodology to piece the, um, these uh, CPUs together. Are there any cases where um, someone might want to build a asymmetric uh, configuration where it's difficult with the slice methodology? Sorry, could you clarify what symmetric configuration means? Um, meaning that maybe you want an odd number of ALUs or odd, odd number of, of, of functional units. Yeah, I mean, at this time, um, you know, we haven't uh, announced any licensing of this, of this IP out to our open power partners. Um, you know, that, that's something that's certainly possible in the future and uh, something that could be addressed. Okay, one more question from the audience. Uh, yeah. Um, going back to some of the early, <coughs> one of the early slides, I can't even find it now, on you know, what you were saying about the slices, you said that one of them was oriented toward the open power ecosystem and one was oriented toward the AIX uh, and IBM structure. Uh, ecosystems. Uh, does that mean that the one of them is going to default to a big Indian and the other is going to default to little Indian, or are those going to be programmatic options in both? Yeah, big, big Indian and little Indian are, are independent uh, variables for the, for the two systems. And, um, you know, the, 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 the alignment is really to provide at a virtualization level, right? We're to provide the, the granularity and mini core count virtualization for Linux and cloud computing versus providing um, the, the level of granularity for partition management where you can really group many threads together for very strong partitions. That, that's really what, where SMT8 uh, shows its, its wings. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, let's thank Brian for a great presentation. Thank you. Okay, the next presenter is Michael T. Clark from AMD. Michael is a senior fellow at AMD who, is, who was the lead architect for their newest generation of x86 core called Zen. He graduated from the University of Illinois in 1993 and has worked on every x86 CPU that AMD has ever produced. Now that's sort of amazing. Um, this uh, presentation is about AMD's Zen processor. All right, so yeah, as I uh, <clears throat> walked into the conference, uh, I noticed that actually Jerry Seinfeld was here last week, and that got me to thinking, hey, you know, it's the last talk of the day, I could just throw this slide up, I could say, yeah, the architects, we just got in a room, we draw a bunch of, uh, you know, boxes, block diagram, yada, 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 out comes an x86 core, we all go home, right? <laughs> but um, clearly, I guess I'm no Seinfeld, and Clearly, Zen is going to be no joke. So um, I do want to say that um, before I start, that you know the Zen team it represents uh, an amazing amount of engineering effort across a global team within AMD. I have the honor to come here and present all that work, all that effort uh, to you guys today. So I really feel honored uh, to to be here. And so uh, we're going to go through uh, the road to Zen kind of how we got there. Uh, then we're gonna talk about uh, the high level architecture of it, walk through, walk through the core blocks, uh, we'll do a summary, and then next steps. So uh, as a lead architect, uh, I actually got to name it, and, and I didn't pick Zen just because it was a cool name. Um, <laughs> I think of Zen as balance, and I think of, of my job as an architect of trying to balance all the competing forces. Uh, you're kind of given a, you know, a transistor uh, allocation. You want to use your transistors as best you can to build the best core that you can. But, you know, there's the competing interests of clock frequency, how much work you can get done per clock, power, uh, the complexities of the ISA, you actually have to get it functionally correct, uh, new instructions you might be adding. So all these things the architect has to balance um, to try to come up with a new architecture. And we were, you know, we were working on our bulldozer line. We were improving it over time towards the excavator core learning. But we could see that we needed to make some, some bigger changes. 
And, you know, you try to make a big change in one part of the architecture, and it really just throws off uh, the balance. And you really realize you need to go and, and rebalance everything and, and do kind of a grounds-up core. So we decided we needed to do that. Uh, we set our, our sights on 40% more instructions per clock while trying to keep all the other competing forces at bay and see if we could build, you know, kind of set a new uh, a point for the architecture to build from going, going forward. So on top of that, uh, we were also, you know, in our product roadmap, we were using two different architectures uh, for our product. So we had a high performance excavator line and we had uh, the low power uh, Jaguar line. So not that we didn't have enough to do, we said, hey, we think we can even cover the whole space with one new microarchitecture. And so we can, we can provide that from one core to go from fanless notebooks all the way up to supercomputers. So uh, this is what we were thinking as, a, uh, as we went into this. And so, of course, you know, um, engineers, engineers, you know, architects are pretty optimistic. They're like, you guys are crazy. What do you mean? You're going to go add 40% more work getting done. Uh, the power is going to go crazy. Uh, most of our environments, you know, you're power constrained. You're just going to, you're going to end up, you know, you're just going to push the frequency down. It's not going to work. And, you know, we, we are, you know, architects are pretty crazy. Uh, I admit it. But we knew that too. And so we knew we had to take a different approach. And so um, for the first time, for a grounds up core, you know, we've been working on, uh, you know, the frequency, the performance uh, for decades. You know, we have really good tools for it and we have good tools uh, for power as well. But we had never really uh, intersected power at the beginning of a grounds up core into the microarchitecture, really looking at every feature we're adding, being able to understand the power it was gonna, gonna cause when, when it was uh, running workloads. And, and evaluating different feature trade-offs that early in the design process. We, we usually were applying the power analysis uh, much later in the design flow at a point when really a lot of the key architectural decisions had been made, and so there was way less flexibility to go attack uh, any power problems that might be fundamental in the architecture. Or, and, and as well as, you know, even with all our other disciplines, you know, we have tools that, you know, as you're building an architecture, it's a very uh, iterative process, feedback what you thought you could build. It uh, doesn't always work out. And so you make changes along the way, but you need to be able to evaluate those changes. So you need to have a, a rigorous methodology to make sure if you choose an uh, unoptimal situation, you find it quickly, uh, you can revert it. And we had, now we had power in that loop too, equal with frequency and performance. So, uh, I'm here to tell you that with, you know, uh, it took a lot of work, it was really aggressive goals, but we were able to achieve that. We were able to add 40% more instructions per clock and hold the energy per cycle in the architecture uh, stable. So it was, the team did an awesome job. And you say, well, uh, yeah, it's great you did it, but how did you do it, you know? And so um, we kind of break it down into the three areas, uh, a better core engine, uh, a better cache system to feed it, and then, like I said, our, our rigorous focus on picking features and iterating on the design to provide lower power in this new microarchitecture. So um, I'm going to go through this a little bit quick because we're going to take a, a deeper walk through the architecture later. But um, you know, essentially, we improved our branch prediction on the front end, one of our biggest features uh, was adding a large op cache. Um, in the x86 architecture, uh, as most people probably know, there's a variable instruction length. This makes trying to find you know, inst multiple instructions to get going into the machine uh, is a very difficult problem because it's a serial process. To attack that, you build a pretty deep pipeline. You spend a lot of logic, burns a lot of power, and um, you know, so we knew we had to attack that. And so having seen those instructions once through that pipeline, we now have, you know, the micro ops and we can store them in an op cache so that the next time we hit on those instructions, we can just pull them out of the op cache. And that both, we can get, uh, we can cut stages out of our pipeline when we're hitting the op cache. We can not use those high power decoders and not burn all that power as well as Removing the state, we can also deliver more ops uh, into the machine per cycle too. So it's, it's, it's a really great feature that both you know, provides 
way more performance and actually saves us power at the same time. Um, uh, the things kind of below that, you can see uh, we both went for a wider machine, uh, being able to dispatch six micro ops versus four, and then a much deeper machine so that we could extract instruction level parallelism out of that. But you know, just, just building a bigger core engine, I mean, you've got to be able to feed that thing. If not, the, you know, all those bigger queues just sit there, and, you know, they're wasting time, wasting power. So <clears throat> we knew that. And so we knew we had to put a better cache system so we could get, get the data to those instructions as fast as possible. Uh, we went to our, our right back L1 cache that was more power efficient. Our previous generation had a write through. Uh, we built a faster L2 and L3 cache. Um, we, you know, uh, with, the, with that cache hierarchy, we were better able to optimize our prefetchers to pull that data into, into the core so when the instructions needed it, it was right there for them and you get the optimized performance and keep a, a, a good, good flow through the machine. And then on the bandwidth side, we doubled the bandwidth uh, for the L1 and L2 and, and our L3 bandwidth is up over 5x. And, and I, like I said, we're gonna walk through the pipeline so you can see uh, how that happens. And so with all that, with those two, we, okay, we have our 40% IPC performance, but yeah, through that process, we, also, we had to hugely focus on keeping the power down. So uh, we, we have aggressive clock gating with multi-level regions throughout the core. Uh, I've kind of already mentioned the right back L1 cache and the large app cache, both of performance and power features that help us control our power. Uh, we have what we call a stack engine. So the uh, x86 instruction set is a stack-based architecture, pushes, pops, calls, returns. And so um, the stack engine allows us to kind of, you know, those are small relative offsets. And so instead of uh, issue, sending those operations into our high power schedulers and execution units, we can actually track those relative offsets within our dispatch unit and we can apply them so that we can cut down the amount of work we need to, to uh, enter into the machine for, uh, for stack-based references, as well as we can eliminate the false dependency uh, between the addresses. So Stack Engine provides both a nice, again, a nice performance boost and a nice uh, power win. Uh, we also have a feature we call move elimination. So when you're moving two registers, uh, one register to another, instead of sending in the machine and, and doing the, the move there, in, again, in our high power uh, uh, schedulers and execution units, we can actually just use our physical register file to change the map, and we can save a lot of power there. Uh, and uh, as I've talked about, we, we had that power focus from the inception. We were, you know, we were evaluating these features, tracking them, making sure they were delivering what they needed to. So then we could, then we could turn the crank when we got to the normal part of the design cycle and, and we utilized all the stuff we'd learned through the do dozer generations on power. We could really put that effort in on the back end and really drive the power down. And the team really pushed hard and did an excellent job uh, to achieve our goals. All right, so now uh, uh, we're going to take a walk through the uh, microarchitecture. Uh, this is, we'll go quickly through, uh, through the flow, and then I'm going to do a deep dive on each block. Um, so we typically start up here with branch prediction, where we're trying to predict the flow of where the program's going. Uh, traditionally, we, you know, we go over to the 64K four-way iCache. Um, and then through our, our decode unit where we can find four instructions per cycle to feed into the micro op queue. However, once we've done that, then we store that in the op cache and then the next time we hit, we can come through the right side. And um, as I said, we cut off several stages of our pipeline there and we can deliver a lot more micro ops into the micro op queue. Now the micro op queue serves as kind of a decoupling point forward into the, the back end of the machine. Um, our microops at that point are, are pretty dense. They're pretty much one-to-one -one, uh, from the x86 instruction base, so we can have good density uh, both in the microop cache and the microop queue. But as they then get dispatched, they then expand out into the different queues. Uh, as you can see, we have a um, coprocessor model between integer and float, and so there's a totally separate uh, schedulers, execution units, uh, and register files for uh, integer versus floating point. 
Uh, we have four ALUs uh, and two AGUs, address generation units, and they feed our load store queues where we can do two loads and one store per cycle into our 32K eight-way data cache backed by the 512K L2 cache that's also eight-way. And then not shown here is we have a shared uh, eight meg L3 cache, and we'll talk about later how that, how that works into the system. And then coming back on the floating point side, again, we have different schedulers uh, than the integer side, so we can issue uh, four per cycle on the floating point side. We, we have uh, two mole and two add pipes, as well as we can, and it's a 128-bit width floating point unit, uh, but we can do two FMAX uh, per cycle as well. All right, and, and we are SMT, but we'll talk about that uh, in a later slide as well. All right, so after that quick walk through the full microarchitecture, we'll take a deeper dive into each block. And so uh, on the fetch side, of course, we have uh, where we start at the top with the next PC when we get a redirect. And we actually, one thing we've done differently is we actually put the TLB uh, earlier in the pipe so that we can get the physical address out and be able to be able to prefetch for the instruction cache uh, a lot faster. But uh, within, uh, within the branch prediction, we can actually store two branches per BTB entry so we can uh, you know, avoid an extra read of the BTB plus uh, the extra density that that allows us. Uh, to have a larger structure. Uh, we support a traditional 32 entry return stack again because of the calls and returns in x86. Uh, for indirect branches, we have an indirect target array. Um, and then as we're coming out of the I side, we have 32 bytes that we can deliver to decode. So then uh, getting into decode, again, we kind of have the two sides. On the traditional side, we have a instruction byte buffer, a pick, uh, the four instructions decode. but Normally, we're, we're hitting in the op cache, so we're bypassing all that saving power. All that logic's turned off, and we hit the micro op queue. As I already talked about, this is where the stack engine is implemented. We also do support branch fusion, where if you have a compare and a branch, those are actually get combined into one micro op in the machine from those two instructions. One schedule, one execute, uh, a nice little power savings, and provides more density again. Um, and then we flow in, oh, we also have a, a memory file where uh, we're tracking when stores go by uh, what their address is at, at the dispatch interface. And if we see a load quickly behind it, we can actually do store to load forwarding at, at dispatch, essentially, and, and avoid and, uh, and improve uh, performance. Um, all right. So, um, now we're getting into the integer execute. We actually can do six micro op dispatch. Uh, we map the logical registers to physical registers. We have a 168 entry physical register file. Um, the scheduling queues, they're all 14 entries deep, distributed. You know, four ALU, two AGU, uh, nice and symmetric. We actually can support 192 instructions in flight with our 192 entry retire queue. Uh, we have differential checkpoints to save power. We're only tracking the actual registers that are different uh, in the uh, being changed by the program. Uh, we can actually execute two branches per cycle uh, in this machine, both in single-threaded mode and, and uh, SMT. Um, and we actually support eight-wide retire, which we found is actually, even though we can only dispatch six, we find ourselves in situations when we're stalled on a, a much older op at times and being able to retire eight at a time and catch up and free up all those resources into the front of the machine can be a, a really good performance feature. Uh, now getting into uh, load store L2. Uh, we have a, pre, a large out of order load queue. So we can have 72 loads uh, outstanding, 44 entry store queue. Uh, for this architecture, we created a, what we call a split TLB data pipe. Uh, traditionally, when, uh, and still is true for us, when, when the data cache is being filled with new data, you can't access the data part. But with the split pipe, we can still send accesses into the TLBs and the tags. And so if they miss, we can send their addresses off to the L2 and, and get the miss started or the L3. And so then we can, it's a way to be able to stream data into our L1 and really manage that cache hierarchy and provide good performance. Uh, and with that, this is where, you know, we have our optimized uh, prefetchers integrated uh, into the cache hierarchy here with the L1 and L2. 
and we have a 512K private uh, uh, inclusive L2. All right. So going over to the floating point unit, uh, it actually has an interesting uh, scheduling queue. Like I said, it's different from the integer side as well. We have a scheduling queue that can actually schedule to the four pipes, but we have what's called a non-scheduling queue in front of it. Uh, the floating point unit typically has longer latency instructions. Uh, and we can't schedule from the non-scheduling queue, but it allows us to dispatch uh, the rest of the instructions to the integer side. So if there are other integer instructions, they can get started. And the memory components of those floating point instructions can get started. And then when they shift in the scheduling queue, they can meet up. And this provides a nice balance point for the architecture. Uh, it can also, the eight wide retire is independent of integer and floating point. Um, we support all the uh, standard ISA, SSE, AVX1, AVX2, AES, Shaw, and uh, we've actually put in two AES units uh, to improve encryption performance. All right, so then uh, getting into the Zen cache hierarchy, um, as you can see, we can provide, can provide 32 bytes a cycle uh, per core, in and out, in between all the caches. Uh, that high bandwidth is what enables uh, all the prefetch improvements to really deliver uh, the performance. Our L3 is actually a victim cache, and so that gives us the ability to you know, really have both the capacity of the L3 and the, and the large L2 across all the cores. So that gives us a, a, a good performance uh, improvement in use of cache data. Um, because of it being a victim cache, you, know, you could miss in your L2 and actually miss in your L3, and it's actually in another core in the complex. We track uh, the tags of all the data within the L3 of the other cores in the complex, so we can quickly go to that core that has the data and transfer it over uh, in that case. And we, we also implement large queues to help uh, drive the bandwidth for handling L1 and L2 misses. All right, so uh, here's how you can see how we actually integrate that, uh, that CPU core complex. Uh, you know, we have the four cores on the side, and we have the 8 meg L3 sliced into four ways in the middle. It's a uh, 16 way associative 8 meg L3. Uh, we actually interleave it by lower address, but any core can get to, uh, you know, the full 8 meg of data, and, and every core sees kind of the same average latency. Uh, from the L3. All right, now our, our SMT implementation. We, um, one of our main goals for, was to make sure that all of these structures we were building are available and we only have one thread running so we can give a strong single thread of performance. And then, um, you know, uh, when there are two threads running, we want to competitively share as many structures as we can so we can. Uh, balance out the throughput if the, if the software, if each program needs uh, a different amount, we can dynamically uh, uh, shift it to the two. So as you can see, our caches, our decode, you know, all the schedulers, execution units, they all um, are competitively shared so we can provide that good throughput uh, to the programs that need it. The, uh, we then have some that we competitively share, but we have to SMT tag them. and so. They still dynamically fight for the capacity of the structure, but they can't actually share between uh, the two threads the actual entries. And so that's our TLBs and our load queue. Uh, in a couple of places uh, beyond uh, the traditional competitive sharing, we actually add an algorithmic priority. Uh, in the branch prediction unit, we're keeping track if one of the threads has a flush and really then needs to get more instructions brought back in. We give it priority so it can get going again. Uh, also, at dispatch, uh, we have some algorithms to make sure we're getting good throughput uh, for both threads uh, in the system. And then we don't like to uh, uh, statically partition anything. You know, that means we had to split, them, split it uh, for both threads. But uh, for you know, complexity reasons, we did uh, split the hard part statically partition, the store queue, the load queue, and the micro-op queue. And, but you know, with everything else being competitively shared, we still see that great throughput with that, so it was a good uh, a design trade-off. All right, and then on uh, the new instructions, uh, in black, kind of have um, just the 
uh, the, the latest additions to the uh, x86 ISA, we have uh, RDC, we have some secure mode access prevention, uh, SHA-1, SHA-256. But, uh, but also we've added a couple things that are uh, AMD exclusive. We have a CL0 instruction that allows you with one instruction to clear out an entire cache line. Uh, as well as, and it's not an instruction, but we have what we call a page table coalescing feature where, um, you know, for our 4K page size, we can take, uh, if we see, if the operating system has laid out eight consecutive pages, we can actually combine that into a 32K page, then only use one entry uh, in our TLB uh, and have a, 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 a hardware 32K page size. It doesn't, it's not a mode, it doesn't require instructions, but it only requires that uh, the OS lay out the page tables that way. All right, so uh, in summary, you know, uh, this Zen is a totally ground up core. Where it sets a new level of performance for us to work from going forward. You know, we took our, uh, as I showed, our totally new high performance core engine. We made it to the new high bandwidth, low latency cache system. We throw SMT on top to give you a good throughput when you need it, and we use the 14 nanometer FinFET uh, to provide uh, a good low power and, and good area efficiency. And so um, we like to say that um, AMD is back uh, in high performance x86 6 compute, but we're not just back, we're here to stay. Uh, we are. Uh, and Zen, is not a Zen was not a destination, it's just a uh, stop on, uh, on the way to uh, more performance. So uh, we are going to continue, we are committed to continue to uh, push uh, high performance x86 compute uh, going forward in the roadmap. So I think that's it. Okay, uh, remember, uh, name and affiliation first before asking your question. Um, yep, Satoshi Matsushita in Nisi. Um, you first talk about the uh, vision that uh, the, uh, the new core covers uh, the juggle and low power. But uh, looking at the, the, the new, new uh, technique is uh, for, mostly for the high-end, super huge cores, like increasing resources and increasing the entries memory so which which technique is uh, is effective to uh, cover the even lower range of core low power core so um i'm not sure i totally got that whole question um the uh but you know uh, whether you're at the low end or the high end you know being efficient and and, and providing good performance throughout uh, the core is designed uh, to do that, so we believe we can cover both the high end and the low end with this core implementation. Thank you. This side. Yep. Yeah. Nirmal from NVIDIA. Uh, great talk. Uh, quick question. You had a 40% uplift on the IPC. Mm -hmm. did, did it include the dual thread or it was that, per, per thread? Yeah, that was just a one thread number. Um, we, you know, we do have uh, we do have you know good throughput in SMT, but we're not um, stating any numbers right now. But we will have that uh, as we get further along. It's pretty impressive. Oh, thank you. Okay, this side. Uh, Dilip Bandarkar, Qualcomm. Uh, your L1 cache is right back. Does it have ECC? Yes. And how much uh, extra latency does that add? Uh, we don't believe it adds any latency. Okay, thanks. Uh, Bill Rash, uh, Intel. I have a question on the uh, cache bandwidth. Uh, the diagram showed 32 bytes per cycle and it showed two unidirectional buses. So mm -hmm. does that mean there are two 16-byte unidirectional buses or what does that mean? Uh, it means we can move 32 bytes a cycle in either direction. So it's more of a bidirectional bus. Yeah. Okay, yep. 32 bytes per clock. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. This side. Hey, uh, Ben Ackerman, NXP. Um, so on your last slide, you showed Zen maybe going to a Zen Plus, whatever that is, one day in the future. Um, <laughs> you, you talked about everything x86, but AMD also is an ARM licensee. How much, if anything, of this helps in like a K12 or whatever it happens to be called uh, ARM custom core? 
So uh, uh, I would just say it, it, it's not sometime in the future for Zen Plus. Of course, the slide says that Zen Plus is definitely going to happen because we're committed to it. And, um, you know, um, I am an architect. Uh, ISA is just one of the things. We can do this with any ISA that we need to. Our ARM roadmap is the same as it's been. And so, uh, you know, we share techniques back and forth to improve performance. And, you know, ISA does add unique quirks on, on, on multiple sides, but in the end, um, uh, we can deliver this performance in any ISA. Okay, thanks. This side. Hi, I'm Rick Lee from VR Technology. And I have a question about the decoder. Oh. <laughs> and in the slide, you showed that there is a micro, micro op queue before the micro code ROM, right? So that yeah. means the operation from the ROM cannot be saved in the queue. So, so will that cause problems occasionally? For example, like there is a complex instruction during a small loop. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Remember, it's just a block diagram. It's you know not 100% accurate. So the, the uh, we actually we don't put the the ops from the microcode ROM into the micro op queue, but we do uh, you know we track the starting microcode ROM address and start starting the flow for it. So you can think of it as it bypasses in we and starts going just as fast as if the ops were in the micro op queue. We just don't waste, we, we want to be able when it's done to quickly switch over uh, to the non microcode instructions that are sitting in the queue right behind it. So that makes Perfect. sense? Perfect, thank you. Uh, this side. Uh, Fujitsu, Toshio Yoshida. Uh, uh, could you show the size of the micro op queue? Uh, how much is the size of the micro op Cash. Oh, uh, the size. Yeah, we're not disclosing uh, the size right now. That will, we will as we get, uh, you know, will come out. But right now, we're not uh, disclosing it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, question <laughs> again on the L3 cache. I'm wondering how multi-ported is it? Can multiple cores be transferring the data at the same time into the L3? I mean, it. Uh, yeah. I mean, it has buffering around it to be able to do that. Yeah. But does that mean at only at any one point in time only 32 bytes are written or read out of the L3 at uh, any point in time? Out of the L3 or the L2? The L3. I'm t oh no, shared. yeah, yeah. It's single port. It's just 32 bytes at any point in time can be read or written into it. Uh, it well, we th those 32 bytes was the transfer rate into mm -hmm. it. In the queues, they can do full writes, and so. I think I'll leave it at that for this. But it's but. still single ported. It's not multi ported. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's all the time we had for questions. Let's thank Michael for his presentation. <laughs> okay, um, we have some um, closing remarks now, so please stay for that. All right, congratulations. You survived two days full of technical presentations. I know it's late and you want to get out of here, so you have one more thing to do. Please pick up one of these forms, fill it up. Let us know how we can do better next year. You can drop it off at the registration on your way out. So thanks a lot for coming, and we're looking forward to see you all again next year. Thank you.